Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City to join us for a virtual tour. The cathedral is fortunate to have had 125 years of growth architecturally, artistically, liturgically. This vast building, considered one of the largest cathedrals in the world, is graced with the efforts of the human family to present the presence of God in various ways, as does a famous ancestor, the Cathedral of Chartres in France, often referred to as a Bible in stone and glass. Cathedrals in general are not only centers to find biblical content in stone and glass, but also reflections of the history of the human family and its endeavors, its struggles, its vision of triumphing over adversity and death itself. The stone and glass of this Gothic Revival Cathedral holds a proud place in the list of world's great cathedrals. Though it is a very young sister, say, to Notre Dame of Paris, for example, at 850 years old, each cathedral presents an opportunity of discovery, like a treasure hunt, tempting and challenging for a child, a young person, any adult. Though we are often reminded that Jesus had 12 apostles, all men, Within moments, the obvious balance of the feminine comes to mind. Not only with Mary, the mother of Jesus, but saintly women like Mary of Magdala, the Magdalene, to whom the risen Christ appeared and sent her with the commission of telling the apostles. I'm always tempted to call Mary Magdalene the apostle of the resurrection and recognize that she has a very important place in the history of the early church. In the spotlight tour of the feminine presence in this cathedral, we look at the treasures in the apse, the area of the great choir and high altar encircled by the radiating chapels of the tongues. These treasures feature women or were done by women, Edwina Sands, Christa, Anna Huntington's Joan of Arc, Cornelia Van Aken Chapin's Cross with Christ the High Priest, the pre-Raphaelite clear story glass with the representation of the woman dressed in sun, moon, and stars, an image taken from the book of Revelation of John, and the important work upon which we focus in this virtual tour, Meredith Bergman's Memorial to September 11th. Seeing the female figure of the memorial, we're reminded of powerful feminine figures seen as nurturing caretakers for our world. First, the Egyptian goddess Isis, the goddess of motherhood and fertility, life, death, and rebirth. In this visual, we see the figure of Isis found in the tomb of Tukunhamun, King Tut. She stands with her arms outstretched protecting the burial container which holds canopic jars. These held his inner organs. Second, the Greek sculpture of the winged victory of Samothrace. She stands at the top of the staircase in the Louvre Museum in Paris. She comes from a history of female winged glory figures. An image like closer to our own time, the Valkyries of the ring cycle of Richard Wagner. These valiant women were charged with the task of carrying fallen heroes from the battlefield to their place of peace in Valhalla. Our third image, on the wall of the altar of peace, the Ara Pacis Auguste, there is a relief portraying the Roman goddess Pax, which means peace. The goddess sits with children on her lap in a sculpted bas-relief. On either side of her, there are goddesses of the heavens with fabric billowing over their heads to image the very arch of the heavens themselves, usually attributed to Chalus, the god of the heavens in Roman history, but here given to all women. The fourth imagery is taken from medieval representations, often women's women's images, in Mary, the mother of Jesus, as La Madonna della Misericordia, the Virgin of Mercy. 
in more re recent history, referred to as Our Lady of Refuge. As an example, let us look at this later medieval figure, the Ravensburg Madonna from 1480. She's from an altarpiece by Michael Erhardt in Upper Swabia from the Church of Our Lady. This is a polychrome figure, color and gilt, lime wood carving. Mary, the mother of Jesus, shelters a family of individuals from religious, royalty, to common people, all gathered in miniature in her cloak. They all look adoringly at Our Lady. They are dressed in 15th century garb, and they kneel with their hands in traditional gestures of prayer. In 2001, Meredith Bergman lived in Manhattan. Her apartment was on 77th Street, a good distance from Lower Manhattan, but she could still smell the smoke of the burning twin towers of the World Trade Center. And so affected was she by the shock and horror and sadness of that day, she sculpted a small figure in clay, a woman with her arms raised in front of her with jets embedded in the tops of her hands. Later, the small figure would be cast in bronze. On the 10th anniversary of those attacks on September 11th, Meredith Bergman was invited to exhibit the small piece on a pedestal in St. Columbus Chapel at the cathedral. Across from her sculpture, there were displayed pieces of debris from the World Trade Center. This led to the invitation to create a memorial with a figure of larger scale, begun from the inspiration of that smaller work in clay sculpted on a frightening day. Meredith Bergman worked on the exhibit with former Dean Kowalski at the cathedral, and the work of the memorial evolved. She strongly believed that the memorial should represent a universal theme, and that women especially, men of course, would find the idea represented in the concept expounded by the terrorists repugnant, killing thousands of innocent people to gain a heaven where 70 virgins would be there to serve them. She felt this was an insult to all women. Meredith Bergman set about creating this striking sculptural memorial nestled in a bright area of the ambulatory which surrounds the high altar area. So now let us look at the memorial itself. Merritt designed a glass pedestal reminiscent of the sleek glass and steel modern towers which were the trade center, including the beveled tops and triangular corners. She took pieces of the debris from the trade center which were at the cathedral and arranged these stained cement chunks, iron rebar, and fabric and placed them in the interior of the pedestal. One of the cement pieces even has a heart shape to it. Her inspiration for the pedestal design came from seeing reliquary cases from the Middle Ages. These cases contained bone from deceased saints or martyrs. These cases can be in architectural shapes like a small building or a container with crystal allowing the believer to actually see the interior relic. It took five very strong men to install the bronze figure created from the original clay sculpture, which had been molded and cast in wax and then cast from wax to bronze. The figure itself is the upper party part of the body of a naked woman. Her bent arms cover her naked breasts She's holding her arms in front of her, reminiscent of the towers themselves. Though her eyes are closed, she stands with a determined countenance, holding out her hands and arms in front of her, her open palms face her. There's a figure of a jet embedded in the top of each hand, 
The nose cone of each protrudes and stretches the skin of each palm like a stigmata, an image reminding us of the story of St. Francis of Assisi, whose intense meditation on the crucifix brought him to the point of sharing in his own body the wounds of Christ, those marks. In this figure, there is a radiant star-like image in each palm from the stretched skin. I never miss making this figure a part of the tours I give at the cathedral. The monumentality of this piece is not the scale, but the content. What is fascinating is what one visitor said to me while taking the highlights tour. Her hands and arms are not in a defensive posture, keeping the jets away. I saw great wisdom in that remark. Her focus remains for those inside. She endures the force of the attack, its horror and pain. It's like a parent sheltering children in a disaster, like a tornado. The parents shelter their children by covering them with their own bodies. This sculpted woman resists the natural urge to shrink and push away danger. She is taking the pain into herself, absorbing the very force of it. So this woman is not only powerful, she's terribly vulnerable. She endures for her children her own flesh and blood. Now look carefully at the sculpture again, and this time in particular her forehead. The figure seems serene overall, but there is great tension shown in the subtle lines of her forehead just above her eyes. On careful study, there's the hint of veins betraying her stately peace and showing the great demand and strain present in an event intended to destroy. This woman is wincing from the pain she's enduring. The memorial figure's arms are an architectural icon for the structures which sailed 110 floors above the ground at lower end of Manhattan until they were brought down with over 3,000 people in huge, dark, debris-filled clouds. Those clouds became a sad inheritance and to this very day produce illnesses which have taken the lives of first responders and firefighters who struggled to save lives on that murderous day when those buildings collapsed. Across the waters of the harbor from ground zero, we can see another powerful sculpted woman who lifts up her arm and holds a torch to light the way for those desperate to find a new life in a free land. And we are reminded of Emma Lazarus' poem, that here is a refuge for huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Awe-inspiring, monumental, impressive, there are many adjectives that can be used for this Statue of Liberty. At 151 feet tall, just the figure herself, and 305 feet with its architectural base, She is her own skyscraper. The woman of the memorial to September 11th at John the Divine is another archetype of the eternal feminine mothering of our world. She offers solace in a different way to those who see her. She's not aloof from the pain which life can present to the human family. People can identify with her, like the firefighter who visits this station every year. I purposely use the word station. Like the Stations of the Cross, people walking prayerfully along Jesus' steps to Calvary. We'll perhaps never know everything it evokes for each person who stops by, though some write down remarks in a nearby book but people do stop and ponder. Like the Jesus of the journey to the cross, 
he was very much with, not apart from his people. We come to this place to remember and look into the face of one who understands and is with us. In this sculpted face, we encounter the face of someone who knows, someone who has been there. Thank you, Meredith, for sharing her with us. Some forever, not for better, some are gone, and some remain. All these places had their meanings. With lovers and friends, I still can recall, some are dead and some are In my life, I've loved them.